Uh, really happy to be here. This is my first Dragon Con ever, and also my first Dragon Con panel. So thank you guys for um, being here. I'm excited to talk about ransomware. Um, a little bit of background about me. Uh, lawyer by trade. I've been a data privacy attorney working in the cyber insurance field since 2013. Um, back in 2013, ransomware wasn't really that big of a thing. Um, I actually remember the first time we got our five-figure ransomware demand in, and I had to talk to um, very high-level stakeholders at my company to explain to them what a ransomware claim was and why our policy was covering it, um, because they, they were a little bit chagrined that, that we would write insurance for something like this. Um, but you know, a little additional background, the whole reason I actually got involved in cyber incidents and cyber insurance in the first place is because I was the only one at my company that knew what a Bitcoin was in 2013. Um, unfortunately, I did not hold on to my Bitcoins in 2013, um, or else I'd probably be in an island somewhere. Um, but yeah, ransomware. Um, how many people here, just to show of hands, actually know what ransomware is? Awesome, cool. We can have a pretty, pretty high level chat then. Uh, but for anyone watching on video later on, so ransomware <coughs> is essentially um, an extortion event. It's when a bad actor gets access to computer systems and encrypts the data, um, threatens to steal the data and disclose the data, um, and even you know threatens employees or senior stakeholders at a company or even customers with the disclosure of that data. And so when we think about a ransomware event, um, you can really think about it as, as like the worst type of cyber incident that you can suffer, right? And I think that's really important when we're discussing to pay or not to pay. I need a little skull right here. But because frankly, it really depends on the circumstances of the ransomware event. And, you know, a lot of times we get um, notification of incidents where someone receives an email that says, hey, I have access to your computer and I see your internet search history and I'm going to share it with your wife. And it's like a 75 year old managing partner of a law firm who's like, I don't have a wife. And also I don't really use the internet outside of work purposes. That's technically potentially a ransomware event. Um, and then you also have incidents where, um, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the, the pipeline incident of a couple years ago, we've had very, very, very high level ransomware incidents um, with the city of Baltimore, uh, with other municipalities. And so that's where they, the bad actor has complete access, unfettered access to um, a computer system and they hold it hostage, right? And so when I think to pay or not to pay, it, 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 and, and you know we're going to analyze this a little bit from a legal perspective as well, but it really just depends on the facts and circumstances of the situation, right? And so as we talk today, I want you guys to keep in mind that when you're thinking about this question or when you're listening or reading a news article about a ransomware event, ask yourself, what would you do? And not from you know, a subjective standard, but an objective one. I don't know, do we have any business owners here? Anyone that owns a business? Well, let's say that you own a business and you've owned the business for 50 years or it's been in your family for 150 years. And you wake up one morning and all your computers are encrypted. You have backups, but you rely upon an IT person who's not really an IT person and the backups are encrypted as well. This is what your family's done for 50 years. This is what you've done for 30 years or whatever it is. You're dead. But you can pay $3,500 to get all your data back. Would you pay the ransom? I'd probably pay the ransom. Let's say you're a Fortune 500 company. You have a dedicated staff of 1,000 IT professionals. Someone gets unauthorized access to your network. Someone clicked on a phishing email, downloaded some type of you know, malware and they say, hey, we have some file trees of yours. We're gonna disclose them on the dark web. We ask them for, you know, do you guys have any data? And they're like, nah, we, we're, we have a ton of data, but we're not gonna share it with you. Would you pay then? Probably not, right? And so the question to pay or not to pay is nuanced. And what we're seeing is post COVID, right? Like everyone was working from home. 
And so if you paid attention to the cyber insurance space or the marketplace, you'll notice that it's going bonkers, okay? Um, if you're in an IT department or you're a sysadmin and you work with a company that's trying to get cyber insurance, you may have noticed the applications are a little bit more arduous than they were a couple years ago, asking more questions and doing more things to try to hopefully stop the payment of claims, or not stop the payment of claims, but stop um, bad risks from being underwritten. Now, when we're again looking at this to pay or not to pay question, you know, as you're thinking about in your head, does it change if you have cyber insurance that specifically covers payment of a ransomware? Maybe, right? That's what you have insurance for. You know, if someone commits arson on your home, you know, you kind of want to rebuild it, right? What if it's just part of a shed? You know, and your deductible is pretty high, but you got a little bit extra there. Yeah, you probably still might exercise that right under your insurance policy. So the interconnection between cyber insurance and ransomware is a pretty hot topic as well, right? Because a lot of people are saying, oh, you guys are actually propagating the ransomware epidemic because you're paying these threat actors, right? I disagree with that, all right? Because I've had way too many interactions with individuals and entities that do not have cyber insurance that bankrupt themselves almost to pay a ransomware payment. And then they don't have the ability to leverage any of the experts or consultants that a cyber insurance policy would provide them. Now, as we're talking about cyber insurance, you should know, like, I am a fan of cyber insurance, right? I think whenever you're going through a panel or having a discussion with an expert, hopefully they should let you know what their biases are, all right? So up front, I think the payment of ransomware under certain limited circumstances is reasonable. I also think that cyber insurance helps, not hinders companies, individuals, when they're dealing with a ransomware event. But I also think that there's very many, very many incidents where the payment of ransom is not reasonable, right? And so something that, um, again, I don't want to get too high level, but we can go into it. Um, do you guys understand kind of how like ransomware, like variants work? Like, so just, again, maybe for people on the video that might not be as sophisticated as the audience here. So a ransomware variant really is identified by either a group or a specific type of malware, right? One of the most famous ones you might have heard is, is Conti, right? And these are a group of hackers, usually you know either nation state or Eastern European, Russian. Um, they develop a software that then um, they can leverage access brokers or they can try to get access themselves and then you know deploy that software on some computer systems. So these ransomware threat actors um, are really, really good at what they do. And they're really sophisticated. And I've helped negotiate hundreds of ransomware claims, maybe even five figures at this point. And one of the weirdest things that has ever happened to me is I was told that the person that we were negotiating with had to go on PTO. And that we'd be talking to their manager, their supervisor over the weekend as they were going on holiday. Um, I've seen very sophisticated customer service websites um, we've received after action reports from the threat actor groups after we paid saying, hey, this is how we got access to your network. You need to close this up. Have a great day. Hope we never talk again. Right. Um, I've also seen threat actor groups call up the spouses of CEOs and CFOs and physically threaten them for payment. Hello Kitty's really good about that. Um, and so the weird kind of juxtaposition of to pay or not to pay ransomware is I think, again, looking objectively, but also understanding that whereas you're making a business decision in a lot of, in a lot, in a lot of circumstances, you also have to recognize that these are international like criminals, right? You can go on YouTube and you can literally see them riding around in their Lamborghinis and Bugattis and Ferraris in like downtown Moscow, okay? It's very, very profitable. Actually, over the past couple of years, I don't know if you guys remember the Equifax data breach, right? The target data breach, all those big ones. We've actually seen a massive decrease in data breaches because everybody wants to do a ransomware attack, right? Because, and, and it's interesting. How, well, let me ask you guys this. How much do you think we typically negotiate down a ransomware payment? Raise your hand if you think 25%. Okay, thank you. What do you... About 40%. No. 10%? What about 60%? 
70? Anybody think higher than 70? Okay. So typically it's from 40 to 60% reduction. Okay. And it really depends on your negotiator and whatnot. And so going back to that question, to pay or not to pay, does monetary amounts matter? So let's say that you're, you're a business, everything's encrypted, you're completely pwned. They're asking for $3,500 to get all your data back. Does that change the calculus a little bit? I'd argue yes, right? Um, so the about cyber insurance is that most reputable policies, they'll actually have a digital asset restoration coverage. So they'll rebuild your computer network to the status quo of what it was before the incident. Now, paying a ransom is not an easy button, and this is also something you need to consider. You don't just press a button, decrypt, and you're good to go, right? You still need to close down the initial access vector, make sure all the bad guys are kicked out of your system. Usually you stand up a completely new environment or sandbox, and then you're slowly bringing in other endpoints into that to make sure they're clean. Usually installing some type of EDR system Endpoint detection response is basically a fancy way to say monitoring system to ensure that there's no malware on the new endpoints. Because retail AV does not work on most ransomware malware. Okay? And so that's something that um, I don't know about you guys, but I hate the subscription model of everything these days. I'm old enough to remember where you could buy something and it would be yours, you know, instead of paying $99 a month for something. Well, a lot of security companies, some very reputable, they offer subscription-based models for their, their endpoint detection response systems or their, their AB, their antivirus. You got to make sure you're getting the right tier. Because I've been on the phone with insurers, like, do you have EDR in place? They're like, yeah, we have such and such. Like, okay, great. Let's review those logs. Oh, there's, there's no logs. Oh, what do you have? And then usually an hour or two later, they call me up and they say, we didn't, we didn't purchase the, the tier that, that actually protects you from ransomware, right? And so that's something else to think about too from an objective perspective. Do you pay the ransom or do you use that money to harden your network, right? Like let's say that it's a six figure ransom, but then you can completely install something that will make sure that this will never happen again, knock on wood, and then maybe incur some extra costs in the restoration of, of your network versus the payment of the ransom. But that's one of the biggest kind of myths about ransomware payments is that it's really kind of contradictory because some people, they're either like, okay, we're going to pay it. We don't care what the cost is because we just want this up. It's like, no, it's going to take weeks to restore versus other people are like, no, we're not going to pay for anything. I don't care if it's a dollar ransom. I'm not paying these criminals. It's like, all right, well, your financial data is encrypted. You don't have any backups. Can you do your business without this data? No, we can't. So in my position, and this is why I was really excited to talk about this topic, and, and in just a couple minutes we'll open it up for questions, be very free form, um, because I don't know the answer to this question unless I have a specific fact pattern in front of me. And sometimes it's yes, and sometimes it's no. Like I know some of you guys said you're familiar with Conti. I highly suggest you look, and just, so they're a very nefarious, very infamous uh, threat actor group in the ransomware space. Um, I think they helped pioneer ransomware as a service. So basically what you can do is you could pay a fee and they'll give you their malware, right? Or they had access brokers that they would pay or affiliates that would get access to companies. Then they'd switch it up to someone else who would then you know, maintain that persistent access and then deploy the malware. And then you could leverage their, their in-house suite of customer service websites and individuals to actually negotiate a ransom and then you get a portion of the ransom payment. Okay, this is big, big business. And so Conti actually had a leak after the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war, okay? Supposedly by a security researcher, which, sure, okay. Not sure why you had access to gigabytes of Conti data, but you're a researcher, I get it. But they've been translated and they're searchable. It is the most interesting thing I have ever read. Because they're, you know, it's people, their chats talking about their vacation, their holiday, talking about their pay. It's like a normal business, right? Like you, how you talk, chat on Microsoft Teams or Slack, right? Except then you'll run across something that says, hey guys, it's a United States Healthcare Week. We're going to try to hit as many hospitals and healthcare entities as we can, right? 
And so read it because to pay or not to pay, the question really is objective, right? Um, but there are some things that you need to kind of keep in mind, right? And so something that, that I think is really important to keep in mind is, you know, are there any legal consequences to making a payment? And for the longest time, there wasn't. Right, and so going back a little bit from and just a little bit of an insurance lesson, kidnap and ransom coverage in the insurance space has been around for a long time. All right, and so there are actual policies that are hundreds of years old that if you're extorted or ransomed, you will you can get reimbursed. You can use money from an insurance company to pay it. Now, the advent of ransomware and our technological society kind of kicked that development in the insurance space into overdrive, but for the longest time, the policy provisions and the type of coverage is available just mimic that kind of, that, that ransom and extortion coverage that typically was used for like kidnapping, right? Um, and so there isn't really any laws out there about it, especially ransomware. Now we are seeing some laws, I believe Florida, some other states are now making it illegal for municipalities to pay a ransom. Okay, so far there's nothing that impacts individual businesses or private businesses. Um, but if you are a municipality in, in I believe Florida, I wanna say North Carolina and a couple other states, um, you can't pay a ransom. Now, the city of Baltimore is one of my favorite topics because they, they got a ransom claim in and they decided not to pay it. And again, to pay or not to pay, to pay or not to pay. It was like a hundred and twenty thousand dollar ransom, and they ended up spending, I think, like fifteen million dollars to rebuild everything. And that's not even quantifying the lost data. And so, I personally think that's a little silly, right? Because if if someone has a gun to your head, rhetorically speaking, and you can pay them one hundred and fifty bucks to like take that gun away from your head pay the money right like I, I i don't i don't understand it and maybe it's because i've seen kind of the existential threats of ransomware and i see like i talk to people that are going through this you know and again if you have any friends or family that are business owners or if you're a business owner you know i i call it the the the, the christmas morning problem you wake up christmas morning to 150 emails 35 text messages 20 calls every computer in your network's encrypted. Maybe you ship Christmas items for sale. You know, because these threat actors, they, they do that. They try to pressure you. They like holiday weekends. It's a very busy weekend this weekend for ransomware. And they'll deploy it on like Saturday morning or Saturday at 2 a.m. And then they're able to completely encrypt everything by the time, you know, someone gets back to the office on Tuesday. So, you know, are we going to face something in the future that limits private entities from paying ransom? Potentially. Um, I hope not because I do see kind of the benefit to cyber insurance. I do see how we can help people and ultimately that's what insurance is supposed to do. Ideally profitably, if we're being honest, right? It's a private enterprise. But you can be profitable in the insurance space and still help people, right? Insurance is a risk mitigation tool. So, I know some insurance companies are actually trying to engage in some lobbying to make sure that ransomware payments remain being able to pay, which is kind of weird, right? You wouldn't think an insurance company would say, hey, we want to continue to pay out claims. But at the same time, I think a lot of the utility of cyber insurance goes away if you can't pay a ransomware claim. Like, yeah, there's still coverages for data breaches and you know notification of impacted individuals, PII that's been breached, things like that. But you know the big ticket issue is ransomware today, and it's not going to end anytime soon. So now what we're facing in the future is going to be municipalities that, I mean, where you guys live, do you think they have your social security number somewhere? <laughs> your address, maybe your salary, right? So now what we're gonna see is, you know, ransomware attacks that are gonna take longer to um, remediate and they're gonna be more expensive. So let's say you can't pay a ransom. Is there still coverage under a cyber insurance policy that would get you back up and running? Sure. Digital asset restoration, 
um, you know, some other things like reputational harm coverages, things like that. But how do you recover from all your data being stolen? Right, you can't, you can't. You know, I mean, I just think about it from like my personal email account, right? Like everyone has that one personal email account you've had for 20 years, at least me. What, what if like that was encrypted? That's how I feel when I think about to pay or not to pay, right? Try to be objective, but I don't have a relationship with the data that's been encrypted. Imagine if you did. And so it's a little bit more of a holistic approach to, to the question. Um, and obviously if it's illegal, you can't pay. Um, and something that the federal government has really tried to um, impress upon private industry is, um, you know, when paying a ransom, are you coming up against sanctions? Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Department of Treasury via FinCEN does uh, has a sanctions list where you are unable to provide a monetary benefit to individuals or companies on this list, so it's called the SDN list, or anyone that owns 51% of or you know of the, those companies. Right, the big one right now is Russia um, because. You know, recent um, administrations have been trying to hammer them via sanctions, secondary to the conflict in the Ukraine, or in Ukraine. I'm sorry, um, and so that is a consideration, right? So yes, paying ransomware um, claims in most contexts, or paying a ransomware demand in most contexts, is not illegal. But now you have this process, an apparatus um, via private entities, where you have to confirm if your payment is going to a bad actor on this list. And you want to know the the kind of weird part about this is if you pay a ransom and you do your OFAC check, you're looking at it saying, hey, there, this individual's not on here, this wallet address isn't on here, and then a month later that wallet address pops up there, you guys are liable. The company's liable for that. So. Paying someone that ends up on the sanctions list, it's, it's, it's called uh, the sanctions list, filing sanctions list is something called strict liability. I don't want to get too legal easy here, but essentially you have different types of liability, right? Strict liability is basically like if you do something, you violated the law. Doesn't matter if you didn't know about it. Because there's this thing in, in the legal world called mistake of fact or mistake of law. So mistake of fact would be like, um, you know, there was a, a, a nuanced law of, of saying something like, well, you're not allowed to walk downtown in a chicken suit, right? And you didn't know about that. So unless it was specifically, you know, because there's a lot of weird laws in the United States, but specifically, if, if you didn't know about that and you, you didn't intend to commit a crime, right? Like you had no idea that it was illegal. Strict liability is similar to if a plane falls out of the sky most likely the airline's liable, right? There's there's no kind of you know, mea culpa there in most circumstances. So when violating sanctions for the United States government, it actually has a look back provision. So you have an ongoing duty in a certain respect to continue to monitor any ransomware payments that are made. And then you have to notify the government if any of those violate the sanctions list. Now, I've been on several calls with FinCEN Department of Treasury um, I've actually presented to them a couple of times as a part of a private industry group. And I've asked them, I said, hey, um, how do we do this? Like, how, how do we make sure that we're not violating this? And, and frankly, they're like, Meh. you can, you can ask us questions. I'm like, all right. And we ask the questions and they're like, we can't answer that. Read the statute. Literally. And we've read the statute and it's like, it doesn't contemplate these situations, right? Like if you make a, I hate to use the word good faith, but a good faith payment to get your data back to a bad actor who then ultimately comes up and let's say what we're seeing a lot now is, I don't know if you guys heard about that recent tornado mixer um, sanction uh, via Ethereum. So, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. I do apologize for being a little over the place. I'll try to remember the FinCEN conversation, but what we're seeing now is the only way to make sure that you're complying with the FinCEN regulations and the OFAC, the SDN list and the sanctions list is to retain a company that can actually track cryptocurrency payments. 
Okay, and there's a couple companies out there that do a very good job of this. Um, it's kind of it's kind of freaky. Like, I've been involved in in crypto since 2013, um, and I was able to lever like use one of their software, and they literally had my Bitcoin Talk um, dot org username that was not attached to anything attached to me and my address. So, like, the type of tracking that they do in cryptocurrency right now and today is very sophisticated. Okay, like incredibly, incredibly sophisticated. Okay, and I'm not telling any proprietary information here, but if you've engaged in a cryptocurrency transaction via, uh, you know, a well-known exchange, or maybe even not, or talked about it, there's a good chance that you have been identified as someone that does this, and they can track you by it. Okay, now you can get around that. There's different cryptocurrency you can use. A lot of things like. Um, a lot of threat actors like to use is Monero. You guys are familiar with that? It's called a, a privacy coin. Essentially, they built into their blockchain technology that it can can hide where the, the funds are coming from and where it's going. Now, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they can't do that, right? It's a public decentralized ledger where the whole benefit of it is everything's there. You can review it, right? So what you can do is you can deploy, deploy various software, different things. The, the big one is a mixer. So essentially, you send your cryptocurrency into this hopefully decentralized protocol and it mixes everything together and then outputs the coins minus their fee to a new address so arguably they don't see the coins coming out right now what they can do though is they can identify where the coins were and going into the mixer and so the US government has sanctioned um, these foreign entities that do this type of service and so the most recent one was tornado mixer uh, which is an ethereum mixer okay now there are arguments for having these types of, of software protocols right like if you believe in decentralized tech if you believe in privacy which i do okay i could see not wanting my financial transactions on a blockchain tract now am i encrypting fortune 100 companies and asking for millions of dollars no but at the same time you know, you can't kind of have, and this is a big discussion in the cryptocurrency space. I'm also presenting on a, a blockchains panel where I'm sure we'll talk about it. But, you know, you can't really do both, right? You can't have privacy and then also open and obvious um, understandings of where money's going to make sure that it doesn't result in some type of criminal payment or action. So what they're doing is they're sanctioning these mixers. They're sanctioning some exchanges right that are known for kind of you know laundering these, these these ransomware payments so let's say you make a payment on a ransomware claim to a bitcoin address or even a monero address that's not on the sanctions list but then that then goes to one of these mixers you now have an event that you need to notify the government about and they've not said okay what type of fines will you suffer what type of things will will happen as a result of this all they've said is well, here's some mitigating factors when we talk about what's going to happen to you, right? And so those mitigating factors are involve law enforcement as soon as possible, and then also self-report. But they don't say, like, they said heavy mitigation. And I asked them, like, well, what's that mean? Is that, like, no fine? Is that no action letter? Is that a 75% reduction in the fine? And they're like, read the statute. I'm like, the statute doesn't say, <laughs> you know? And, and obviously typical government people, they just don't want to tell you anything. So when you're thinking about to pay or not to pay, yes, there's no law prescribing it per se for a private company. But if you're a municipality, you might not be able to pay. And then do you want to incur the extra compliance risk that you might have to deal with by making a payment? Now. I can tell you, um, I've been dealing with ransomware claims for a long time. I've not had a single claim violate OFAC. And so we have entities that we work with that will help facilitate payments and that will also do these OFAC checks. Many of them engage in these kind of, you know, third party software companies that can kind of do this tracking from a pretty nuanced um, detail. We've never had a violation. And I'm sure you guys can probably guess why, right? Like, how hard is it to get a new Bitcoin address or an Ethereum address? 
you know now something that I think might happen in the future this is my personal conjecture is I think they might start sanctioning ransomware variants so if you get a I mean an oldie but a goodie goodie so to no kibi ransomware event right because they pop up every now and then maybe they maybe the SDN list says you can't make any ransomware payments for that variant now what are they going to do they're going to change their name tweak their software um, and then keep on doing it right but the problem is from a legal perspective is you're then kind of taking that risk away from a risk mitigation tool of cyber insurance right because cyber insurance or any insurance policy really you can't get a payment for something that's illegal right like if, if, if I intentionally ram my car into someone, I can't then go to Geico and say, hey, uh, can you fix my fender? You know what I mean? Um, in cyber insurance policies, they have a provision that says that if, if, if a payment would violate any type of sanctions, legal or regulatory framework, we're, we can't pay it. So who then pays it? Or does the insured or the entity just not pay it? And then at that point, you know, from a pu public policy perspective, which in the legal world you hate to, to hear that word because it could mean anything, right? And it could really be like, well, what, what, what is your policy? You know, what is public policy? What percentage of the population are you leveraging for that policy position? But I don't think that we want to take away the risk mitigation tool of insurance and put it on the individual, right? Especially when you're dealing with an existential threat. Right. So I've just spoken for 35 minutes um, and I apologize for that. I do like talking about this. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hello. Um, I was wondering, is there or what is the organization or mechanism to track reputations for bad actors to be like to be confident that the bad actor is going to follow through and unencrypt your data? So that, that's a great question. Um, so <laughs> for the longest time, we would say that there is like this honor among thieves. Right. And for encryption, there is because um, I've only had, I've never had a, a ransomware threat actor not try to encrypt. I've had several instances where their decryption key did not work. And they, would, they spent hours of their time trying to troubleshoot it. But there was corrupted data during the initial encryption process, and that was why we couldn't unencrypt it. I even had one ransomware actor who refunded us the ransomware payment. Yeah. So there is a weird honor among thieves. Um, if they are a well-known variant, the likelihood of encryption is very high. Now, what they will not do is delete your data. Now, for the longest time, the biggest concern with the ransomware context was data encryption. How do I get my data back? But then Conti, among others, got really smart because they're like, oh, people are getting better backups. So they're like, hey, we're not just going to encrypt your data. We're going to steal it. And now we're going to publish it on the dark web. And so do you pay? And that's another thought process on to pay or not to pay. Do you pay for the non-disclosure of private business data? It depends, right? Typically, we don't recommend it. Because looking at the Conti leaks, Conti promised some of my stuff's on there, uh, if you know where you're looking, uh, that they would delete all their data. They did not. Terabytes of data in storage, holding on to it, probably selling it to data brokers or other people. So if it's social security numbers, things like that, that you know, if you have the know-how you could probably get access to in a couple minutes, uh, we would not recommend payment. Now, if there's additional bases for payment, like um, I had one insured who was a healthcare entity that serviced a uh, marginalized and specific um, ethnic type population and 
were, you know, they got all their data back and up, up and running like the same day. And it was a very large demand. It was like 1.5 million. And we're like, well, we don't think we should pay. Your data's back. You're good. We're not going to pay for non-disclosure because they don't, they, they still have it. They just take it off their site. And we were talking to one of their board members and they said unequivocally, if this gets released, people will die. People will commit suicide and they will die. And he explained a little bit more, and everyone in line was like, yep, let's pay this ransom. Let's go. We'll negotiate on best terms up to a milli. Got it down to 700000 So there are reasons to pay for non-disclosure. But that was a great question. Thank you. No, not generally. I, it's just so for purposes of, of the video. Um, well, no, no, you're fine. No, you're fine. So said, is there an organization that tracks the, the, the reputation or you know these threat actors if they actually make payments? And, and not to my knowledge, I will say that the ransomware payment industry is very incestuous. Uh, there's f several main players that everyone works with and that they publish um, you know general communications and, and things like that. Um, and you know it's not too hard to get access to some of the proprietary evaluations of various threat groups. Um, I, I don't want to list any names, but if you want to come up and chat with me afterwards, we can talk about it. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out how uh, these organizations, how the ransomware players uh, actually in encrypt the data. In other words, uh, uh, do they have to uh, have somebody on the inside to get access to a uh, uh, physical access to uh, one of the inside uh, computers? Or uh, or not, or or do they uh, can can they get in from anywhere? Uh, sure. And and more particularly, how do they encrypt backups? Because uh, it, it seems like if you have a backup, it would be untouched at least initially. So do they put in their uh, software and then wait for a while for all to be backed up and go on the backup uh, so that uh, y you know like five days or ten days uh, later and and then uh, spring it or, or sure. what happens yeah no it's a g great question and and so I, I don't want to Dunning Kruger myself I am a lawyer by trade I'm I'm not a technical expert I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night so feel a little bit more comfortable but I've handled a lot of these claims, so I can answer that, but from a technical perspective, um, don't take what I'm saying as sacrosanct. But generally, um, all the above. So we have seen very limited insider threat access. It is by far the exception, not the rule. Most typically, it's bad security practices. It's bad security hygiene, and it's human error, right? So something that, um, you know, a lot of insurance companies are doing now is they're actually doing scanning of domain infrastructure. Okay, and so what they do is they look to see are there any, any critical vulnerabilities that can be seen outside of an organization, and then are there any open access into the organization? Because you can scan a company via the right domain and say, okay, do you have any open access there? Are you open up on port 3830 or something like that? And there's actually search websites where you can plug in a port number and it will scan the World Wide Web to let you know every entity that has that port open. Now, arguably, you should have it only accessible via VPN with multi-factor authentication in place. A lot of companies don't do that. So if you have this remote access, <laughs> it's just the door's open. You can just walk in, right? And then a lot of times they can deploy other type of malware like Mimikatz or Cobalt Strike, which are kind of advanced. In, in Cobalt Strike was actually a, a white hat thing. Like it's something that good orgs can use. Um, but it basically can scan for credentials. And then once it gets the right permission level of credentials, they have the king keys to the castle and they can do whatever they want, right? Or if they don't have the ability to actually review and see what's going on on a network. Because as I said earlier, retail antivirus will not catch a lot of the malware that these ransomware threat actor groups use. And uh, speaking about backups. Sure, yeah. So um, people don't test backups. So, the, like, in order to, to make sure that your backup function is working, you need to test it, right? So I've had insurers who are like, yeah, we're not doing this ransom. we got on-prem backups, we got physical tape backups, we got cloud backups. And they're like, yep, cloud backups are encrypted because there wasn't a secure method for transfer. And if you got access to the main server, you could get access to the backup server. 
Um, the on-prem backups haven't been backed up for six months, and the tape backups are corrupted. Hi, Rich. We want to pay the ransom now. So, yes, backups are really the only way to combat ransomware. Because, you know, as you know, something I, I say, and, and some of my more technical colleagues disagree with this, and we'll chat about it more in depth after, like, but um, as defenders, we need to be perfect. As attackers, they just need to get lucky, right? And so with backups, if you're not compartmentalizing, if you're not testing it, and if you don't have, if you're not updating or patching it, right, zero days are a big issue, you're pwned. So he asked if, if you could get access to backups via like the main computer, main computer system. And it depends on, on, on how that is set up, right? Ideally, it's compartmentalized or air-gapped where your backups are not part of the same system that you're actually working on or your prod environment. Because then if your prod environment gets, gets hacked, then your backups are safe, right? But um, often that's not the case. So it, as you talked about municipalities, um, Baltimore is now could you talk a little about the ransomware attack on the city of Atlanta? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have knowledge of that? Yeah, a, a little bit. Um, and, and I do apologize because I, I get them in Baltimore mixed up in my head a lot. Um, so I think they decided not to pay the ransom as well. And um, the increase in cost was also similar to Baltimore. And it goes to that question of, you know, I don't think payment of ransom should be a political question. It should be an objective question. Month, it's, it's, it's dollar signs, right? Like, and what's the impact to the populace, right? Because we saw, we had our first ransomware death um, in Germany a year or two ago, where a hospital was hit with a ransomware attack and some functioning equipment got um, interrupted and a person died. So there are real repercussions to encryption. And my statement to any municipality that legally can pay a ransom is, what do you win by not paying? What's the benefit? You know, um, because is it increasing your taxpayers' bills by a thousand person, a thousand dollars a person? Is it by losing decades of data that you can never get back? Is it by incurring additional costs? I don't. I personally don't get it, and it's something I'm a little bit more aggressive about, just because, you know, I don't want to pay ransoms. I don't. I hate it. I absolutely detest it. But if, if I can ensure that an entity keeps on doing what it's doing or that people are less likely to incur costs or lose data that's important to them and it makes sense from an objective perspective, then I think it needs to be considered. So I think these kind of line in the sand laws for municipalities are a little bit misplaced. Um, there is a very large percentage of people that think you know, you're only going to get rid of ransomware when you stop paying it. And I think that the only way for that to work, I mean, it would have to be similar to like gun control in the United States, right? You'd have to take everybody's guns, right? For ransomware, you'd have to like stop everyone from paying. And just the hellscape that that would cause, at least initially, I don't know, maybe it would work, maybe not. I don't think so. Um, but, you know, again, Ultimately, the decision to pay has to be based on many factors. And when you distill it to one thing, even if that one thing is do not want to pay international criminals, then I think you may be doing a disservice to the population that you service. Uh, my question went back to uh, my question went back to Baltimore as well <laughs> as the example. Not to get into the politics of it, but I kind of had two questions. Well, the first one you kind of answered already having to do with can you trust them, which, you know, you know, you're talking about honor among thieves. Yes, if it's just un unencrypted data, probably if the price is reasonable, but mm -hmm. not if it's, you're looking for confidentiality. The right. But the second part of that is saying that you, uh, if it was, they end up paying out what, fifteen million dollars to rebuild afterward. How I much did. of that was? But how much of that was was inevitable costs anyway? Doing the things they should have, putting in the infrastructure they should have had in the first place to help prevent that sort of thing. 
these were, you know, a lot of right. that 15 million was probably stuff that we're going to have to pay whether they paid the ransom or not. Right. No, I think that's that's a great distinction there. And to, to the first question, um, I forgot it. <laughs> I was I totally was involved in the second question. So let me ask the second question first and then come back to okay. the, the first one. I think that's a really good point. The problem with, from my understanding, the, the, the Baltimore, like, and, and from a cyber insurance perspective, you, you don't get, unless you have a specific coverage purchase, you don't get to, to improve your computer systems. That's called betterment, right? It's to get you back to the status quo. Now, the type of cost incurred by Baltimore, a lot of it was data recreation, okay? Because they did not have backups. Backups were not in a, in a good place. So they had what we would call mission critical data that had to be recreated. Now, the cost to doing that is often very expensive. Now, I'm not familiar with how they remediated and what type of you know, software, hardware things they put in place. That can be very expensive too. Um, I would think not, you know, high seven fig or eight figures. You know what I mean? Um, seven or eight figures, whatever it is. I don't, I don't math well. Um, but you know, th generally the thought process is is that if they would have paid the ransom, the costs to respond to the event would have been orders of magnitude less. Unfortunately, I don't have the specifics there. But that is something that when you look at the totality of the circumstances you want to make sure that that you're reviewing right because if it's going to cost five million dollars to get you back up and running even if you pay the ransom you don't want to pay the ransom and, and then there's also the other the exposure legally for paying if it ends up going to a wallet that is sanctioned right and you know and that's an issue um you know we've not seen it yet um at least i've not seen it um and now that re also reminded me of your first question but you know yeah that is an issue now again um, when weighting the different factors on to pay or not to pay, I would not weigh that very high, to be honest, um, because you're doing an OFAC check and you're, you, you're leveraging experts that do this all the time and that might even use some of the more sophisticated technology to assist that check. Um, and so again, you know, I've handled hundreds, if not a couple thousand of ransomware claims and we've never had anything violate OFAC. But to your first question in regards to confidentiality and um, like notification or publication of data. So what a lot of people don't know is all you need is access to personally identifiable information or private health information and you need to notify. It's not exfiltration. So you have a bad actor, actor that there's evidence of them being in a server and you have PII or PHI on that server, you have to notify. So paying for non-disclosure, it's not like, all right, hey, Conti, you're going to keep this quiet, right? I won't tell anybody about this. It's not. It's hey, we're notifying 50,000 people that we had a ransomware attack and their data may have been accessed. So again, to pay or not to pay, if you're notifying an, you know, a population of the access and the potential breach, giving them credit monitoring, and then also you know, letting the world know that, hey, this breach happened, what are you really paying for for non-disclosure? Thank you. No problem, thank you. I apologize if you already covered this, it's been late, but how helpful is CISA and other government organizations that are trying to like contact us and we'll help walk you through stuff. So um, we have actually, and again, not being political, but um, during the Biden administration, we have seen a, a very large focus on ransomware. He has made it a key part of a cybersecurity framework. Um, CISA has kicked it into overdrive. Um, they actually have a lot of really good documents and um, actually um, information and websites that you can go to to kind of assist with, you know, figuring out your cybersecurity footprint, helping you understand what you need to do to kind of harden your network and things like that. Um, and also the FBI, Secret Service, other law enforcement entities, um, which is one of the things I wanted to talk about, but we might not have time. They're being super helpful as well. There's um, law enforcement, uh, FBI groups working on every major ransomware variant. Um, we're in contact with them. They're assisting us. Um, we've even gotten decryption keys from law enforcement for some variants. I can't disclose those publicly, um, but there is a focus on stopping this. Um, the FBI has told me personally that we don't care if you pay ransom. We just want to catch the bad guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so I had a question about um, kind of the calculus that goes into whether or not to pay the decision. So you mentioned a few different scenarios one of them being like 
kind of personal information of like a CEO or executive, um, you know, PII or other like legally protected data, general data that might be embarrassing to a company, and then also um, like data for say like customers. So it's not internal data the company's being embarrassed about, but they could face backlash from their customers. How did those different um, things kind of filter into the thought process on whether to pay or not to pay? Sure, yeah. And um, typically the holy grail of, of private data is personally identifiable information and private health information, right? Social security numbers, driver's license numbers, um, medical records, things like that. Um, and so if you have that type of data that's at issue, you're going to have a notification requirement, like I said earlier. Now, as the so a year or two ago, we would pay for non-disclosure without really any issues, because we really thought they were deleting the data. Silly us. Um, and then the Conti leaks happened. Um, other entities that focus on ransomware payments basically came out and said, "There's no evidence that they they delete data." So um, because of that, we've kind of transitioned to saying, "Hey, it's not a worthwhile benefit to pay for non-disclosure." unless there's some secondary basis for it. Now, there are some theories that with private health information, there is a benefit with the Office of Civil Responsibility. They're the entity within the Department of Health and Human Services that kind of manages HIPAA. Um, that, that, that paying the ransom for non-disclosure can be helpful. I don't know if you saw the eye roll, but um, we've had legal advice from a couple of our attorneys that we work with that um, that handled this they've said you know that can be a potential mitigating factor that all this PHI is not sitting on the dark web somewhere um, so yeah I mean it's it's hard to rank obviously if it's just name telephone number we're not gonna do that right um, but something else to keep in mind too is we've had insureds and, and clients that have had uh, trade secrets downloaded and they're like hey um, <laughs> we've been working on this for 10 years and if this gets out to our competitors we lose a competitive advantage worth you know 10 figures all right sir I would like to write you a check where would you like me to write that to you um, so that's something to consider as well so even though you're dealing with personally identifiable information private health information there are other types of corporate data that would we would want to protect as well but it's really like cost-benefit analysis if you had a calculus for it like an actual equation how much is a ransom more payment? How much is notification? Do you have to notify? What's the, you know, what, how much is that? And then, you know, is there any reputational risk that would result from, from the disclosure of this info? Hey, so I'm joining a, a new company where cyber insurance is gonna fall under my role. And a comment that was made to me is that for coverage this year, they had to take three policies to match last year's coverage and even some insurers were exiting the market. Can you kind of talk through how you see the insurance riding and maybe exclusions changing? Sure, yeah, years? so I'm speaking on cyber insurance tomorrow at 1 p.m. I'm on there. In this room, sweet, cool, <laughs> awesome. Yep, you have four minutes left. I just wanted to go back to literally what you were just saying, that's my question, which is dealing with intellectual property with these bad actors, what is to prevent them from reneging, particularly when they are, you know, because it is, if it is trade secrets or, aha, you don't know that, we, or there's no way for them they can just tweak it a little bit and then right. copyright it or patent it for themselves right. or is that just something that yeah, they it, really it, factor it, it's, it's a risk and so um, again they don't delete things right the question is are they going to use a nuanced technology to do something in Russia or Ukraine or whatnot or are they just going to take the million and a half dollars you gave them and buy a new car now if they can sell it they'll sell it okay um, but if if you know so that's the thing you can't trust them to not disclose it what you're paying for in the non-disclosure space is you're paying for them not to list it on their name and shame website and have it readily downloadable on tour um sorry i'm too short um the if you're let's say a small private company or a medium-sized private company um what are steps that their in-house people could take to with insurance get get coverage is there are there things that they require and all of that kind of stuff yeah no i mean typically most reputable insurance carriers are requiring mfa on everything so emails remote access um any type of server access backup access things like that 
I've had ransomware claims where like says admin passwords were brute forced. And it's like, hey, like you're in charge of like a 500 endpoint system. Why do you not have MFA on your access to this? Um, so MFA is a big thing. Um, expect to have your, you know, a fairly long application and just have someone with IT knowledge answer it. And if you think that you don't know an answer to a question, say so, right? Don't answer the wrong thing. Don't say, hey, and again, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, and I can chat a little bit after with your questions too. But really it's, it's what is gonna keep, because a lot of times ransomware is just serendipitous bad luck, right? Like you only have the uh, bad luck to be hit because something happened, someone made a mistake, right? So training of your employees, Make sure they understand how to recognize and not click on a phishing email. MFA on emails, because we still see email breach in 45% of all ransomware claims, okay? MFA on any remote access, even if it's the CEO, had a ransomware claim come in once, CEO had remote access, not behind a password. I said, hey guys, at my current company at the time, we reported it to them, said, hey, you had RDP open in this port. Like, yeah, CEO didn't want to remember our password. All right, your business is down for a month. Um, so, and things like that. And what I would caution you to do too is shop around for an insurance policy that gives you something. Insurance is getting more expensive. There are carriers out there that actually will offer risk management, risk mitigation tools that can be helpful to you. And actually during the underwriting process, they'll help you plug the po holes that your, your network might have. Thank you. No problem. I think we have one more minute. Awesome. How often do you see ransomware requests out of band of what is appropriate requests? <coughs> something too expensive for the business, outrageous, or yeah. something low, like 120,000, like you're talking for the business. So it's kind of weird. Like if you had a bell curve, they'd probably be about even. But I've actually had claims where um, their demands were so high, the insured and client was just like, yeah, we're not paying that. That's ridiculous. Whereas initially they're like, we're paying this. We need to pay this. Absolutely. And it's like, okay, well, you got coverage. You really want to pay $2 million on this? No, no, we don't. And then other times something will come in because I mean anything under like five figures is really cheap now. And so if we get something at like $35,000, it's just, it's what like $500 was or $350 was like two years ago. So, well, thank you everyone for your time today. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Great, great questions.